Welcome to the Gilded Age and Progressive Era, a podcast about the United States and the world in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. I'm your host, Michael Patrick Cullinane. A very warm welcome back to the show. Today we're talking about one of those titans of the Gilded Age, a name that is sort of synonymous with the period, Jay Gould. Now we've talked about Jay Gould on the show before, but not quite like this. In other shows, he's been a bit part in stories. You know, when we talked about the Western Railroad expansion, Jay Gould pops up. Or in the episode called The Laird on the Lamb, Professor Clive Webb talked about Gould getting swindled by a British, well, faux aristocrat. Today, Gould gets his own show, and rightly so. He's a looming figure in the period. I kind of equate him to the Darth Vader of the Gilded Age. Uh, He's also a Horatio Alger figure. He came from nothing, really, pulled up by his own bootstraps in some ways. And he's one of those nouveau riche, a robber baron and speculator that took advantage of the laissez-faire industrialization of America. Gould locked horns with other railroad industrialists like Cornelius Vanderbilt and Daniel Drew. He also attempted to manipulate the gold market by deceiving President Ulysses Grant. And he nearly took over the Western Union Telegraph Company, recognizing that the only industry more important than the railroads was telecommunication. So to call him brilliant somehow obscures his dastardly nature and his willingness to do anything to make a buck. Talking about Gould today with us is Greg Steinmetz. Steinmetz calls him an American rascal in his biography, which I think captures the vibe quite well. Gould was a rascal. Steinmetz, on the other hand, is a journalist, and he's perhaps best known for his work with the Wall Street Journal before he joined Ruane Cuniff and Goldfarb as a money market analyst. Greg has also written a previous book called The Richest Man Who Ever Lived, The Life and Times of Jakob Fugger. Fugger was a German merchant, miner, and banker. He handled the banking for the Habsburgs and for the Vatican in the 16th century. He also built a monopoly over some European precious metals, and by the time of his death, he created a philanthropic foundation that funded housing projects and Renaissance architecture. Now, does that sound familiar? I mean, Greg is exactly the person to write about Gilded Age American industrialists. So, welcome to the show, Greg. Thank you very much, Michael. It's good to be here. Well, a lot of the listeners of the show will know what makes Gould a major figure of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era. And I want you to just tell us, you know, in your own words, as a biographer of Gould, who is he? And I'm wondering if we can have a little fun with it. If you had to write an obituary for Gould, how would you go about writing it? Uh, Well, you would have to start out with the fact that uh, Gould was involved with some of the biggest economic events of his time. Uh, most notably the the attempt to corner the gold market. Uh, Shortly after the Civil War, Gould um, saw an opportunity to uh, make money by buying up a bunch of gold contracts and then doing his utmost to manipulate the price and uh, to the point where he tried to rope in President Grant, uh, snookered the New York Times into into promoting his agenda, um, did everything possible to, to make a bunch of money on gold and uh, nearly succeeded. And that's the event that goes, went down in history as, as Black Monday, uh, the first one. The, the, the market blew up after the whole gold scheme came unraveled. So that's what gold is best known for. And you'd have to lead with that in the obituary. Um, but as, as much of a um, manipulator and um, as much as he was you know, a, a criminal in some of the things he did, you also have to give Gold a lot of credit uh, for just becoming who he was. He, he came from nothing. He grew up in a little farm in upstate New York. He worked his tail off his whole life. Uh, he had his own business from the time he was about 14 years old. He was a surveyor. He worked tirelessly. Um, finding one opportunity after another, while at the same time getting up before sunrise to hit the books, uh, becoming a, a world-class uh, student and scholar. Um, so you, you combine his brains with his ambitions and, and you have someone who was really unique and I think special. 
Uh, so to just write off Gould as a crook, I think would be wrong, but you certainly have to acknowledge the things he did that crossed the line. Yeah, the title of the book is somewhat of a giveaway, right? American Rascal, but it doesn't tell the whole story. I think you you mentioned his youth there. Something that struck me uh, that you wrote about was the tragedies he faces and his, his education as well. Could you elaborate on that? Because it seems like a really formative part of his life. Yeah, uh, I was thinking when I, I wrote the first chapter, almost of a Disney movie where where the mother gets killed off in the first scene of, of Bambi or Jungle Book or something. Uh, that's what happened with gold. So I thought, okay, I don't want it to just paint a one-sided portrait of gold. I, I also want to make him a little bit sympathetic. And what better way to get readers to sympathize with your subject than to have him uh, be a victim of, of such a horrible tragedy. So I, I let off with that. Uh, he was four years old. His only recollection of his mother was when he he kissed her uh, her dead lips uh, on the day she died. That's all he remembers about her. His father was an alcoholic um, and he was sort of a mean drunk. There was once when he locked Gould in, in the basement for a while and then forgot where he was. And it was Gould's sisters who, who finally figured it out and came to his rescue. Um, he, I, I, I think for, for that reason, he, he saw that life is easier for people who have money. And I think that's really what motivated him. And he did everything in his power to make sure that his kids would grow up in better circumstances than he did. Um, and uh, so I think those early experiences were, and the tragedies he suffered were really important to shaping who uh, Jay Gould became. And Gould's first business as well was something I didn't know about. He worked in leather or he worked in the leather industry. How did he cut his chops in that trade? Well, at the time, the leather business was a, a big business. Um, some of the biggest enterprises in the country in you know, the pre-Civil War days were, were tanneries because you needed leather for all sorts of things. You needed them for saddles. You needed them for, for boots and shoes and, and belts. And le leather was, and this is before you had any synthetic goods. So leather was a big deal. Uh, tanning is done by taking... Uh, the leather, throwing it in a vat and boiling it up with bark, which softens it up um, and turns cowhide into something that you can use as a, as a material. The, the key to being a successful tanner was having access to a cheap source of hemlock trees, which is where the bark comes from that makes the best tannins. And Gould had a, a cousin or uncle or something, something like that, who was in the tanning business, told him a little bit about it. And Gould thought, okay, if I can find uh, some good tanning, uh, a good hemlock grove somewhere, I can make a lot of money. And he uh, talked to a lot of people and figured out uh, that there was an opportunity. And along the way, he got to know uh, a guy named Zadok Pratt, who was the most, uh, probably the, the richest businessman in New York State. Uh, at the time in the 1850s. Um, he was a, a congressman, he was a farmer, and he was also the, the king of the tanning business in New York. He had a place um, upstate uh, that had a huge uh, hemlock grove. Gould convinced him to go in with him on a deal uh, for uh, some acreage up in Pennsylvania. Pratt didn't believe that Gould actually had found this. And at the time, Gould was I don't know, in his early 20s, Pratt was six, in his 60s, and again, you know, a very well-known, well-respected businessman with a lot of money. Together with Gould, they rode into the, the wild hills of uh, Poconos. Uh, they found this tanning grove. Pratt gave him a lot of money to build the factory, get the thing started. Uh, and then they had a falling out because uh, Pratt was, was interested in doing all sorts of technical innovations to make the process more efficient. Gould just wanted to start getting, uh, generating cash as quick as he can, quick as he could. And uh, some of Pratt's ideas got in the way of that. They had a falling out. Then came a, a really devastating uh, recession, um, which 
knocked the prices of, of leather goods down. It uh, made the, the factory almost worthless. Gold was able to buy out the factory for a, a pretty low price and, and uh, found some partners and uh, did okay with it. But eventually he learned that the real money to be made in tanning wasn't from, from uh, boiling uh, leather hides and tree bark. It was in the buying and selling. And there's a place down in New York City, which is now uh, near City Hall called the Swamp, where, where all the trading of leather for most of the country was done. There would be uh, importers from as far away as Argentina. They would send their hides to New York. The stuff would get uh, converted into leather in New York and then get sent to shoe mills and everywhere else. Um, that experience showed gold, um, not just that there was other ways to make money in tanning besides making it, but also uh, that financial markets offered huge opportunities. Uh, the swamp was located as it happens just down the road from Wall Street. Uh, gold immersed himself in Wall Street and uh, became very good at, at buying and selling stocks and bonds. And so from the tanning business, he got into uh, investing in railroad stocks and other things. It's an interesting, you know, segue in his life that, 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 you know, this place in New York sort of inspired him. But how does he make that transition to, you know, from being a, a speculator in leather to buying railroads? It seems like, you know, the, the Erie Railroad is critical to his rise. How does he how does he battle for the leadership of the Erie Railroad and how does that shape him? There, there was a the Erie Railroad at the time was the biggest railroad in the country. And uh, it was a rival of the New York Central Railroad, which was owned by uh, Vanderbilt. And Vanderbilt wanted to get control of the Erie because if he got Erie, he would then have a monopoly on all the long hold railroads in the Northeast. Um, the guy who was in charge of the Erie at the time was a, a uh, stock manipulator and a famous short seller by the name of Daniel Drew. Uh, Americans might know uh, Drew University in New Jersey. It's, it's named after Daniel Drew. Um, Drew and Vanderbilt were fighting for control of Erie because Vanderbilt could go onto the stock exchange and buy up shares in Erie and, and uh, try to make a run for taking over the company. Gold by using uh, options, by buying options, which were a lot cheaper than buying stock in Erie, was able to, to position himself as sort of the kingmaker between the two of them. Uh, he was a nobody at the time. He just figured out that, well, if I'm, if I'm able to accumulate enough votes, uh, I could get myself elected to the Erie board and then decide which way I wanna go. Um, and that's what he did. And it became, after he decided to side with Drew, because Drew was going to cut him in on more deals than Vanderbilt would, um, it became a very nasty fight known as the Erie War, uh, where after uh, Gould and Drew solidified their power over Erie, um, uh, Vanderbilt came after them with everything he had. Uh, he was particularly upset about the fact that the way they, they were able to get control of Erie and make sure that Vanderbilt didn't have a chance was that they just printed up a bunch of stock certificates um, and sold them off to the market, just diluting the number of shares that um, the percentage ownership rather that Vanderbilt had. And it was, it was a very sneaky move. It might've been illegal. They were able to get away with it because uh, gold um, paid more money out in bribes to the to judges and New York state legislature. There's a lot of corruption at the time. And Gould was able to outsmart Vanderbilt, which was a stunning achievement for you know, a guy in his 20s um, going up against you know, the great commodore of Vanderbilt. Um, so they succeeded in getting control of Erie, uh, but it cost them so much money that Erie was sort of a, a bankrupt empty shell by the time uh, they won control of the thing. Uh, Drew dropped out thinking there was no money to be left to be made in Erie, but Gould, by issuing even more stock, ended up making a lot more money than anyone ever thought possible. There's a really great story in the book about uh, Gould and Fisk fleeing Manhattan 
uh, to Jersey during one of these uh, these these conflicts for control of the Erie. Um, it seems like anything's legal in New Jersey if you don't get caught, right? If you can stay away from the the, the bailiffs. But uh, we before we started talking, you mentioned that Gould might have been the inspiration for the character, the Russell character in uh, in the Gilded Age, Julian Fellows' HBO uh, show, The Gilded Age. Uh, there's been speculation that it's Vanderbilt or Gould. How do you what do you think about this? Yeah, you know, I'm glad we're getting into this because I tend to get caught up in the financial minutia because I'm a finance guy. Uh, but Gould is a much more interesting character than just the the sum of his financial dealings. Uh, the George Russell character, I, I think it's without question Gould, and uh, I think. I think maybe even Julian Fellows, who came up with the show, talks about this. Uh, for one thing, it looks just like. Uh, although the George Russell character in the sh show is is fairly tall, Gould was was tiny. He was five one. He had the beard. He had the mustache. Uh, and Vanderbilt, on the other hand, uh, uh, just had a, a very different look to him. Uh, and he had the 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 mutton chop beard. Uh, the George Russell character doesn't have that. Another thing, uh, where he lives. Gold lived on the corner of Fifth Avenue and and Forty Seventh Street. Um, Vanderbilt lived on Union Square, uh, but it's clear from the show that that the location is near Central Park. Um, but even even more telling is the fact that. Uh, Gould, although he was a crook as a businessman, he was a devoted family. Man. Uh, he had six kids. I, I think in the show that it's mostly about about their daughter, but the the conflict about you know trying to to marry off the girl, uh, the relationship between uh, Gould and his wife was very close, just like it is in the show here. They had a lot of respect. For one another, um, the tension with the Astors that comes from Gould. Uh, Lady Astor refused to invite Gould to um, and and his wife to her parties because there was the financial fights between Vanderbilt and uh, um, and uh, and Gould, but also which uh, the Astors found to be you know just nouveau riche nonsense. Uh, but also the Astors looked down on anyone who wasn't old money like they were. You know, the Astors you know, came up through the, the sale of beaver pelts, so they were once poor themselves like gold, but they didn't want any part of, of the railroad barons. Uh, so, and uh, that that was that caused a lot of, of anxiety for Gould's wife, you know, in, in real life. Um, so that comes from from Gould. The part um, the story that comes from Vanderbilt, uh, maybe it's episode one or two, where um, the, the Russell character, he's trying to get a franchise from New York City to, uh, to build a railroad in, in town or something like that, um, and ends up uh, in, a, in a fight with uh, the city council. Uh, the city council thinks, okay, we're going to prove this thing. It'll make the stock of of the railroad go up. We would buy the stock ahead of time, and then we'd yank away permission to build it, and the stock will go down. And before that happens, we're short the stock. Um, that happened. Uh, that was a Vanderbilt story where he ended up uh, cornering the the market for the stock and uh, bankrupting actually some of the members of of the legislature. And he, he sort of laughs about that. In a way that you know, Gould would laugh about. It. So that's that's the one Vanderbilt story that I saw from the show. Um, and then another, you know, there, there's not enough about about uh, Gould and Vanderbilt in that show, in my opinion. There's there's a lot of schmaltzy stuff. But for me, the interesting stuff were these business deals. Uh, there's a story about the train accident, uh, where where one of Russell's uh, railroads. Uh, trains runs off the tracks, kills some people. They try to pin it back to him in a way that, if they succeed, would would ruin him uh, personally. Um, 
there were there were train accidents all the time. Uh, that would that story doesn't have any basis in fact, as far as I know, because uh, that was just a fact of life. If you had railroads, there were going to be accidents, and there were going to people people who would die. So the Erie actually had the the worst safety record of any railroads out there. There was plenty of grousing, but it never rose to the point where where uh, Gould was at all threatened by it. Um, so, yeah. So I th think if you add it all up, um, Gould is is the one that um, uh, is the base for that character. And and of all the robber barons, he was probably the the most interesting one uh, to center the story around because he does have his the sympathetic side, uh, and the the relationship with his family and his wife. Uh, was genuine and we don't talk about that an awful lot in in the classroom i can certainly tell you i've never really spoke much about gold's personal life or his his family life whereas with other robber baron characters that that does come up uh there's another character that might be a, an opportunity to add some color to this as well and that's jim fisk who you call a bad influence on gold which is that, that i don't know how that that can be but uh Listeners will know of the name, perhaps, but maybe not a whole lot. So could you elaborate on who Jim Fisk is and why he's a bad influence? Yeah. Well, Fisk was a uh, was Gould's partner for, for several years. Uh, he started as a uh, as a as a huckster uh, driving around the, the New England countryside in a covered wagon, uh, selling pots and pans and linens to to housewives, uh, he was very good at. He was a showman. He was a promoter. Uh, makes a bunch of money uh, during the Civil War by by smuggling goods back and forth uh, over the enemy lines. And through this character Daniel Drew that I mentioned before, he gets to know Gould and becomes his partner in that battle for the Erie Railroad. Uh, the The reason I say he was a bad influence is. Gould was the brains of the operation. Fisk was the one with um, uh, who could make things happen. Um, I, I talked earlier about how the way they they foiled Vanderbilt was to print up a bunch of Erie stock. Um, Fisk was the one who who executed that. He was the one uh, down in the basement of the Erie building, making sure that they were printing the certificates as fast as they could. And then he's the one who who took the certificates and dispersed them on Wall Street in a way that Vanderbilt never knew what was going on. Um, and he, Gould was already an audacious character, uh, really pushed the limits and, and went beyond uh, what was considered, if not legal, but socially acceptable at the time. And Fisk just had no qualms uh, about anything. And he, um, uh, I think, would would go Gould to to go even farther than Gould would go on his own. Um, he's he's a, a very interesting character, uh, both because of his outside per, outsized personality, and he's also the love interest in the story. He had a notorious affair with a. Uh, with a woman named Josie Mansfield, who I, I think was probably a prostitute, uh, falls deeply in love with her, um, ends up in a nasty love triangle, and on the uh, in a staircase in the Washington Hotel in New York, he he gets gunned down by the by the lover, um, and that was uh, devastating for for Gold. He was speechless. Um, that was like having his right hand removed. Um, and, but once Fisk was out of the picture, Gould, I think, cleaned up his act a little bit. Um, all, the, all the really outrageous, um, crooked things that Gould did, um, those, those involved Fisk. And he became more of a traditional businessman um, once Fisk was off the scene and Gould was left to his own devices. We have to talk about gold, obviously. I mean, you led with the, the the gold story as being probably one of the most infamous parts of Gould's life. And that's, you mentioned Black Friday as well. Uh, people might know about 
what happened on on those sort of fateful days where he tried to corner, although corner might not be the right word, but corner the gold market. How did that play out? And if you could also tell us, how did it change Wall Street? Because it seems like his most aud audacious play. The gold caper that started when, when gold noticed that every year at harvest time, gold prices ran up. Um, and the government would would intervene in the gold markets and try to keep the gold price uh, from, from getting out of hand. This gets into some very, very technical points of finance and international currency markets, um, all the rest. But, but the thing to, to know here is that um, the gold price was, was being manipulated at the time by the government. Gould thought if he could convince President Grant to just let the gold price seek its own level based on market forces, uh, that he could make a lot of money by buying up gold before that happened. The trick was getting Grant on board. Um, he got to know uh, a guy who was Grant's brother-in-law, who was sort of a, a crooked Washington lobbyist, um, someone who, who uh, could, could relate to Gould and the way he did business. So between the two of them, and with Fisk's help, um, they bought up a bunch of gold and then began doing everything they could to, to uh, get Grant either by bribing him to come along on board or convincing him to let the gold price run um, to, to help them make some money here. And they, uh, although there were plenty of people in the Grant administration who was crooked, Grant himself was pure. They, they weren't able to bribe him, but they were able to convince him. Uh, and they were able to do that by uh, saying, well, if, if you don't let the price run, uh, US farmers are gonna be stuck with a lot of grain. It'll be bad for the economy. Uh, Russia's gonna end up selling all the grain to Europe instead of the US. It's gonna be very bad for the economy. It took a long time. They convinced Grant to go along, but they also planted the idea in the, in the minds of people on Wall Street that, that Grant was in on this for financial reasons. And as long as people thought that Grant was in for financial reasons, they knew that the gold price uh, could go really high before the government would do anything about it because that way Grant would make a lot of money. Um, and this all came to a head on Black Friday after um, Gould had bought up as much gold as he could and uh, also, um, I want to get this straight, Fisk at the same time was, uh, was buying gold on his own account uh, based on nothing more than um, the, the belief that, that he could make good on his promises to, to buy all the gold that he said he was going to buy. Uh, they developed this uh, fight on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange between those who were buying gold and those who were selling gold. Um, and it ended up pushing the price to a sky high level until the point where the short sellers, who were the, the people selling gold who didn't really believe that President Grant was in on this, uh, pushed to the point where no one would, would sell any more uh, gold to Fisk. And it all came crashing down in this course of about you know, 10 seconds, uh, the price fell from you know, 160 uh, for a gold contract to about $100. And anyone who still owned gold at the time was wiped out. Um, gold, however, because of, of Fisk's activity, was able to, to uh, sell all his gold and get out alive. Uh, Fisk was left holding the bag, but because of um, Gold's connections with uh, crooked judges and others, uh, Fisk was able to uh, beat the rap. Yeah, fascinating. And also one that leads to a depiction of Gould in cartoons that seems to be rather anti-Semitic. I mean, you say that uh, in the book that they, they turn Gould into a caricature, a Jewish caricature. Why do you think newspaper editors did this or or, or artists, cartoon artists did this? Yeah, well, 
Gould himself was um, raised Episcopalian. His ancestors came over on the Mayflower. Uh, he had a great grandfather who fought alongside George Washington. And he was uh, what at the time, and I guess you still call him today, a, a nativist. Uh, uh, he belonged to the English Dutch uh, folks who, who first came over to America. So he was part of that club, that ruling elite um, in the colonies and, you know, and that continued to hold on to power for a long time after that. Uh, but at the time the US was, was uh, becoming very popular with immigrants, particularly from Ireland, but also people from Eastern Europe. Uh, there were a lot of Germans coming over. Um, a lot of Jews came over from Eastern Europe and anti-Semitism was running very high. Um, go, going back to all the, the stereotypes about Shylock and, and all the rest, um, newspaper editors didn't like what Gould was doing, uh, but it was, it, was, it was easier for them to condemn him if they could say that, that he was um, not only a bad character, but he, that he was also Jewish. And they based that on the fact that, well, his skin was a little darker than, than some people. He had somewhat longish nose. He had, he had dark eyes. Um, and uh, that he, uh, he aligned with the, with the stereotypes uh, of Jewish bankers and the Shylock character and all the rest. So with that, with absolutely no basis in fact, they just came out and said, well, we think this guy's Jewish. That's all you need to know about him. So therefore you should hate him. Unreal, um, especially because he seems to be involved in just about everything at the time. You know, people maybe weren't as well informed about Gould, who he was and what he was all about. But in the 1880s, he is everywhere. I mean, he's involved in telegraphy, the elevated railroads in New York City, political corruption. And then we didn't talk about this, but we talked about it in a previous podcast is financing of the Western railroads as well. But these are also the waning years of his life. Does he ever get beat? Well, he has a, a near death experience where he, uh, the stock market moved against him. He was uh, exposed and uh, had a lot of debt. Uh, but he was almost too big to fail. Uh, the the, the uh, investors who had him over a barrel because uh, uh, he had shorted the stock, and they were long, and they, they could have put him out of business, but to do so would have, would have blown up the whole market and, and caused trouble for everyone. So Gold was able to uh, threaten them by saying, okay, you can do this, but I've I've already drawn up papers for me to go bankrupt. And when that happens, you know that's going to be a disaster because all the stocks that I own, I'm going to have to dump immediately on the market. That's going to drive prices down. That's not only going to hurt the market and it's going to hurt your investments, but it's going to drag the whole economy down. Do you really want that to happen? So he was able to negotiate a deal where um, uh, he uh, was able to save himself. It cost him some money, but he, he ended up escaping that with his fortune intact. Um, that, that's another thing where, where you see in this Gilded Age TV show where um, Gould would do those kind of things that, that the George Russell character did, where he says, okay, here's what it's gonna be, take her to leave it. Um, and that was the, the one time where, where Gould um, almost lost everything. So one thing that occurred to me when I was going through this book, when I was doing the work is some of Gould's success, it was just luck. There are some things that could have gone the other way. There's this character that you've talked about on your show in the past, Jay Cook, who was a Philadelphia banker who um, was the, the one who sold treasury bonds to finance the Civil War. Very successful guy, ends up losing everything because his, um, Sitting Bull upsets his plans to build Northern Pacific Railroad. Uh, Cook was a very, very smart, very rich, very well-connected uh, banker. Um, and 
he just got unlucky. And had something's broken the other way for Gold, we probably wouldn't be talking about him now. As talented and smart as Gold was. It's incredible that, you know, because Cook is the same and there's there's others like Vanderbilt. These bankers and industrialists are so highly levered, you know, uh, that they're putting all of their uh, eggs in one basket for some of these deals, whether it's the Northern Pacific or whether it's, you know, Western Union or or or, or the railroads. And then you've got Gould's passing. You would think, you know, I mean, maybe he's not as highly leveraged at, at, his, at his death, but what does his death do to the markets? Are there any ripples or, you know, is it just something that seamlessly passes on to the next generation? It, it was, it was well known that gold was, was ill and uh, wouldn't hang around for uh, forever. Um, Vanderbilt lived to a very ripe old age um, and uh, gold had been, you know, going back to his days in the tanning business, um, he he developed uh, he developed lung problems and some other things just because he worked himself so hard, never got enough sleep, uh, was was sleeping under the stars, uh, you know, in, in freezing temperatures. Um, it, it ruined his health when he, when he was still in his teenage years. He, he was fighting that his whole life. Uh, so people expected that uh, at some point Gould would have to. That that he would pass on, and and maybe the estate would sell some stocks. Um, but he he uh, made sure that his financial house was in order, that there wasn't a lot of debt when he died, and so his holdings in Western Union and the railroads, uh, the Manhattan Elevated Railroads, all these things, um, he could just pass on to his heirs, and it was, it was a very seamless transition. Um, but it's it's interesting. You mentioned these other folks. Uh, you know, I think of the Robert Barons. Most people think of the Robert Barons as being uh, Vanderbilt, uh, Carnegie, and Rockefeller. Those are the, the three big names. Uh, the The reason I wrote the book is I think Gould should be as well known as as any of them. His contributions were as large as any of them. His his fortune was was right up there with them. But people might know the name Gold, but they don't know him to the same extent that they know these other names. Um, the reason is that what we we're just talking about, Gold was sick and he died young. He was, um, I think, 56 when he died. Um, that was just about the time when these other guys started to do things like uh, fund Vanderbilt University or uh, build uh, Carnegie Hall, put their names on things. Gold. Uh, could have done it. He would have gotten around to that. New York University had their hooks in him at the time he died. We could be calling NYU Gold University had he lived to be as old as Vanderbilt. Um, he didn't. And for that reason, um, people just don't know Gould's name. Um, even though, like I said, he was as important as, as any of these guys. And I argue of all the robber barons, he was the biggest robber of them all. Uh, I think that's a that's a good uh, way to bring the, the the show to the present day as well. The NYU could have been Gould University. I mean, certainly we have all the modern day connections to the the so called robber barons. Do you think we have any Gould equivalents today? I mean, when I was reading the book, I couldn't help but think about Elon Musk. Um, is there any equivalent? Yeah, well, Elon's probably the best. Um, and I say that because with the bid for Twitter, he was trying to get control of a, a very in, influential media platform. Um, Gould at one time owned the New York world. He used that to manipulate stock prices and, and make a lot of money for himself. He also um, had control over uh, the Associated Press wire service because of his ownership of Western Union. So in there is a presidential election between uh, Grover Cleveland and a guy named James Blaine, who was the Republican. Gould was in the Blaine camp. And Gould delayed election results from some key states that, that went for Cleveland uh, because he wanted to give the Blaine forces more time to manufacture some votes. Um, and if you think that 
Eli's influence in Twitter was partly to you know, have a bigger voice in you know, the affairs of the country. Uh, that's right out of Gould's playbook. So um, I think, yeah, more than anyone and, and the audacity that Gould did things uh, like Elon, uh, but Gould, as much as he was in the papers, he didn't, he didn't seek publicity like Musk does. Um, so that was different. Um, and I, I was thinking some of the other Robert Barons, uh, Carnegie was probably like, most like Bill Gates in that Carnegie wanted, uh, decided early on to, to give all his money away and, and be very involved in charity, just like Gates is now and giving you know, half of his net worth to the Gates Foundation. And uh, yeah, the, the parallels between our current Gilded Age and then, you know, that's why they, they say we're in a new Gilded Age, the wealth disparity, um, the list goes on. Fascinating. Your previous book, which I haven't had the pleasure to read yet about Jakob uh, uh, Fugger, is also a character, well, the richest man in the world uh, ever, I think, is, you know, as, as you depict him. And uh, what 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 are the things that surprise you about these characters, these, you know, elite, you know, we wealthy beyond anyone's comprehension? What is it that surprised you about Gould or or Fugger or you know or, or or other people that you 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 know either know today or you know know of or know personally perhaps I don't know but uh, what what are the characteristics that you know drive them and, and what surprises you? Well, the the thing that uh, I really admired about Gould is um, was his intelligence and his his work ethic and his complete devotion to his passion, which was making money. Um, he, he had a, a winning combination there where you know, every, everything about him was just set up to make money. Um, and just like uh, you know, a, a great artist or uh, a great athlete, uh, he, he had natural gifts and he was able to find a way to express them. Um, and, uh, his, his audacity, uh, was something that set him apart. Um, and his, I mentioned his intelligence, you know, he was, he knew the law as well, if not better than his lawyers, he knew accounting better than his bankers. Um, uh, he was just the whole package. Um, and. Um, I, I've come across plenty of business people these days, and you know it's very rare to to find someone like this. Uh, the thing about Fugger that uh, you know, for, for for those who don't know, uh, Jacob Fugger was a a banker during the time of of Columbus and Leonardo da Vinci. He was in Germany and he funded the Habsburgs and allowed them to. Uh, create the, the Habsburg Empire that at one time you know, was the biggest empire on earth. Uh, he also provoked Martin Luther to, to start the Reformation and, and change history. So he was a, a very important figure that, again, isn't well known. I, I like writing about these figures that people should know about, but maybe don't know about. Uh, the thing about Fugger that more than anything struck me was just how at a time when there was a very a uh, firm line between peasants and aristocrats. Fugger was able to stand up to the Habsburgs so that they had to regard him almost as an equal. And he did that because he was so gifted uh, that he made himself indispensable to them um, and made a lot of money for himself along the way. So one of the reasons I did this school book was, you know, I work on Wall Street and the people I work with um, everyone has heard of Jay Gould, but no one knew anything about it. Everyone could say something about Vanderbilt. Uh, they would know that he was involved with railroads and steamships and all that. But if you ask someone, okay, how did Jay Gould make his money? Very few people would know. Maybe they've heard the name Jim Fisk and just know, okay, he was a, uh, this crooked businessman from, from that area, era, but no one knows anything about Gould. So here's an opportunity to, to bring to life someone that anyone with, with any interest in Wall Street and 
in American history should know about, but probably doesn't know much about. That's a great reason to write a book. And it makes me think that I need to talk to more people to find out what they don't know about the Gilded Age, the uh, the Wall Street set. What are they not reading and how do we get get them to read it? But uh, Greg, it's been a real pleasure talking to you about gold. The book is out next week. Uh, it's uh, it's going to be it's going to be available in all good bookstores. And, and thanks for joining the show. Yeah, thank you very much, Michael. Thanks for having me. Well, that's all we have time for. Thanks for listening. You can follow the Gilded Age and Progressive Era on Twitter or on my website, michaelpatrickcullinane.com. Please consider subscribing or reviewing the podcast wherever you listen because it really makes a big difference and helps direct others to the show. I hope you'll join me again for the next episode.